Welcome everyone. My name is Maria, I'm founder and CEO of Women Wearables. And today we have another WOW webinar um, on our schedule. This time we are talking about a topic we haven't talked in a while, uh, ever since we did our first conference, last conference in January. And today we are talking about the future of beauty, um, inclusivity, technology, what's the role of technology in the world of beauty and so on. And we have some incredible speakers with us who will share their insights and stories and startup journeys with us. So I expect this to be a very interesting discussion. Um, before we kick off with the, with the panel, uh, before Anya continues with the panel, I want to briefly just tell you about Women of Wearables. Uh, I know that uh, some of you might not have heard about Women of Wearables. You are not WOW members, or maybe this is the first time that you're attending our webinars. So Women of Wearables is a global community organization. We really try to connect and support women and allies in the world of technology. And we initially started in 2015 as a very small meetup group of 10, 15 women and uh, with the focus on wearable tech only. And from there, we grew to uh, focus on different sectors and industries such as IoT and health tech and femtech and everything in between. So we currently have more than 20,000 members in 50 countries. And apart from just, you know, all, all it's for us, it's all about community building. Um, we do lots of webinars, events, education is very important to us. We do uh, a lot of knowledge sessions, which I'll mention in a moment. We have built some incredible partnerships with companies over the past years. And if you go to our website, you'll find a lot of useful content, uh, mainly interviews with women from the world of technology. If you're not a member yet, please do become, if you're interested in joining us, and you can use the code WELCOME for 20% off our annual membership fee. And for those of you maybe who are, you know, on the very beginning of your journey, or you're looking to a bit more support and education, and you don't know where to start when it comes to legal and marketing sales and everything in between we have a couple of months ago joined a wow knowledge hub which is an online program for anyone who's interested in um, getting a bit of knowledge around how to grow and start your business so you can meet our experts in residence through our knowledge hub and you can really meet people who can you know help you with a bit of advice you can get a bit of mentorship as well. Um, and I think all in all, it's a really useful um, platform for anyone who needs a bit of support on their entrepreneurial journey. And now, uh, last but not least, if you want to get in touch with us, you can absolutely get in touch with us via email. We would love to hear from you. You can follow us on social media and Twitter. And um, one last thing before Anya kicks off with the panel, we would love to invite you uh, in June to our upcoming conference, which is all, which will be all about investing and fundraising in health tech and femtech. Uh, and we will be covering a variety of topics on that conference, similar to the last two ones that we had the last in this year. Um, we will talk about crowdfunding, we will talk about product development, we will have session with investors, we will hear success stories from startup founders, um, we will hear really interesting insights from venture builder companies who are providing variety of services to startups um, who are looking to start uh, a business in the health tech and femtech space. So this should be a really interesting one. Uh, date is 17th of June, Thursday. So we would love for you to join us. And now, uh, without further ado, uh, Anya can uh, introduce herself and she can start with the, with the panel. Over to you, Anya. Thank you, Maria, for the introduction. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us uh, this evening or morning or afternoon, wherever you're joining us from. Uh, please feel free to use the group chat to tell us where you're joining us from, to introduce yourself. You can also link your LinkedIn profile as well so that we can all connect later on. Uh, we are recording this and we will also say, save the uh, group chat transcript. Uh, and send everyone uh, the recording and the transcript tomorrow with all the uh, resources. Uh, but now, without any further ado, I would like to wish a warm welcome to our uh, speakers tonight. I'm really excited uh, about this event. Like Maria said, we haven't covered beauty and beauty tech uh, in a while. So I think that the best way to start is with short introductions of everyone. So if everyone could just tell a bit uh, about themselves, your company, your role, uh, and how you ended up in the beauty uh, industry. Uh, Lauren, shall we start from you? Sure. Hi, I'm Lauren Lovelady. I am the co-founder of Each and Every, which is a clean and sustainable beauty brand. I've been in the industry for about 12 years. Um, I landed in the industry out of school 
I've always been super passionate about beauty. I'm a junkie. I, I love trying new products. I love consuming beauty content. And so I knew that I wanted to work in um, the beauty industry. And so I just pursued opportunities um, within the industry. It's been a little bit of a windy road to get there. I had some stops in corporate marketing and investment finance, um, but ultimately that gave me good experience for the journey that I'm on today. Thank you so much, Lauren, for telling us more and for joining us uh, tonight. Aisha, can we hear from you? Absolutely. Thank you for inviting me and for having me here. Hello, everyone. My name is Aisha Batu Fatima Dozier, but everybody calls me Aisha. I'm the founder and CEO of Bossy Cosmetics, and we're a two and a half year old brand. And I often tell people that Bossy Cosmetics is a mission driven women's empowerment business that just masquerades as a beauty company. We sell beautiful, high performance, high quality cosmetics, but we also offer a lot of engaging and topical content and essential services for women who self-identify as ambitious. As I said, I've been in the industry for two and a half years as a beauty entrepreneur, but I've been a beauty consumer for probably 30 years. And my background is in finance. I was a finance executive for 22 years. And I dealt with imposter syndrome throughout my entire journey. And the basic philosophy of this business is, as I said, women who self-identify as ambitious is igniting confidence through beauty, through content, and through products. Exciting to be here. Can't wait to get into it. Thank you so much, Aisha. Nibi? Hi, thank you so much, Anya and Maria, and thanks for having me. So uh, my name is Nibi Lawson. I'm the founder of Kinky Apothecary, um, and we use AI and machine learning to um, kind of give our textured hair users a hyper personalized experience and match them to products that will work for them. So we're just um, trying to cut out the headache and wastage that comes with trial and error. Um, the company started as just a retail platform because I moved to Nigeria, couldn't get my hands on products for my textured hair. Um, and I realized there was just a general lack of knowledge and understanding surrounding natural hair, um, even though everyone in Nigeria pretty much has <laughs> my hair texture. So um, that's how we kind of started to build a community. But then as the natural hair boot came into effect, um, we had so many new brands coming onto the market and people just got more confused about what to get. And so that I realized that we needed like a way to just kind of cut through all that noise and um, help them find products that will work for them. So it's not limited to Nigeria. So we're now approaching things from a global standpoint. We're launching in the UK in a few months. Um, and also like Aisha Chi said as well, we've got a bigger message of basically trying to just um, help women to just embrace their beauty as it is and not basically given to Eurocentric standards of beauty, but just embrace everyone, embrace their own um, unique identity and unique beauty. And that, that is our overarching mission as well. So thank you again for having me and I'm looking forward to this discussion. Thank you, Nibi. And please keep us updated about the launch in the UK uh, as well. We would love to promote it among our community as well. Nidima, can we hear from you? Hi. Hi, um, thank you for having me. Um, so where do I start? Um, I'm one of those crazy people who just loves working. So I've actually worked on this side since I was 15, like every summer, I'm just crazy that way. Um, so I actually started my career in investment banking for seven years where I did data, quant, analysis, et cetera. Um, but then I qualified actually as a beautician at the London School of Beauty on the side as a makeup artist and beautician. And then I merged basically two, three of my loves, which is finance, data and beauty. And I launched my first beauty tech company about seven, eight years ago, which is My Beauty Matches. Uh, I initially bought it because there was lots of other women like me who were incredibly busy and I wanted to help them find the right product for them in terms of price. But also we launched or we kind of uh, started the whole personalization in the beauty industry seven years ago with the whole digital diagnostics, et cetera, et cetera. So that was kind of very much picked up in terms of um, awards and press. And then I started advising some private equity companies in beauty. Um, and then I launched my own beauty tech dinners. And then long story short, now for the last two years, I'm actually working on beauty matching engine which is an AI technology specifically for the beauty industry. So the way Netflix personalizes and predicts what to recommend to you, we sell technology that does that to beauty brands and retailers so they can predict and recommend more uh, products to their customers with the beauty angle to it. Wow, thank, thank you. you. Thank you all so much for sharing uh, your stories. They're so exciting and you are also inspirational. And I think that... 
we're ready to start. And I want to start this panel discussion with a very direct question. It's 2021. Is the beauty industry inclusive in your opinion? And what would be your definition of inclusive beauty? Nibi, can we start from you? Gosh. Sure, yeah. So um, I would say that the beauty industry is not inclusive at the moment as it stands. Um, well, not entirely anyway. And I would say that obviously there are um, players and huge players entering the market. So we've got Fenty, Irma Beauty, we've got all of us here on the panel. But um, as it stands, I wouldn't say it's entirely um, mm -hmm. inclusive. So if you just, for example, take the hair industry into consideration, the UK hair market, you have black women spending about 80%, apparently, about 80% of the hair care industry is spent by black women, even though we only make up 4% of the population. But I can't walk into like a Boots or a Sainsbury's in central London and just have a choice of products that will work for me as easily as somebody with straight hair would. Um, mm -hmm. So I think that you have got a lot of, um, you've got a lot of brands kind of trying to address that. You've got um, a lot of, campaign, so there's like the 15% pledge, there's the pull up for change. But um, I think you really also just have to kind of sift through, we have to do a lot of sifting through to see which ones are actually genuine. So last year oh, yes. when um, after George Floyd murder, we had um, the everybody posting black squares. But then if you go back and look at the brands that posted that and sort of jumped on the bandwagon, how many of those have actually kind of really done anything to make a change since then? Um, so um, when you really yeah. sift through who is like genuinely kind of making changes as opposed to who's just doing it for sure, I think it's still a really small proportion. But then that just also means that there's a lot of opportunity as well. So I think it's a great position for all of us. To... But that, that's a really, really good point, uh, Nebi. I couldn't agree uh, more with you. You know, uh, it's not just about the trend. It's also, you know, way uh, beyond that as well and building something authentically. So uh, I couldn't agree more with what you just said. Uh, I read somewhere uh, and I like the definition, inclusive beauty is beauty for all. Uh, and I like that, that one uh, a lot. Lauren, can we hear from you maybe? What are your thoughts on this? Is the beauty industry today as it is inclusive? And what would be your definition of, of the inclusive beauty? Yeah, I very much agree um, with Nibby. I think that there's still a long way to go. I see brands making a more deliberate effort now to be inclusive, um, but I think the difference is just consistency. So you can't um, say you're inclusive and check the box. You have to be consistent about really showing up for all. Um, you know, one of the ways that we're really passionate about inclusivity is in non-gender categories you know today you still see very gendered approach to different categories like there's this belief that if you like the smell of florals that you must identify as you know female and you have to shop in the women's aisle versus if you like you know the smell of woods then you must be male and have to shop in the men's aisle and i think even the fact that there are separate aisles forces a binary choice um so to me, inclusivity extends beyond just, you know, seeing people represented, which is very important, but also product design, um, like Nibby mentioned, like Fenty in their 50 shade range. I think about universal standard and their size range. Um, so it's product design. It's also website accessibility, making sure that, you know, the visually impaired and hearing impaired can access products online. It's about diverse creators and having creative points of view that are diverse. Um, you know, as you're telling your stories, I think it extends across all touch points of brand identity and really needs to be woven into the DNA of who you are and what you stand for so that it can be consistent over time. Wow, yeah, that's that's all true, uh, Lauren. Thank you so much. Nadima, what are your thoughts? I think you're muted. Oops, uh, I, I totally resonate with what uh, Nibi and Lauren have said. Um, and I actually, something really rings true with what Nibi said as well, which is like, there's a lot of talk, but not so much action. Mm -hmm. Like a lot of it, I think I love the beauty industry. I'm, uh, you know, I've been in it now for eight years, but I think we're a bit guilty or the beauty industry is a little bit guilty of saying a lot of things for a PR effect, but not really like acting on it. And I think customers are starting to notice that. Um, when I look at inclusivity, I think it's not just about ethnicity and gender, but there's mm -hmm. also 
like since yesterday I'm vegan and I would like to be able to buy you know identify vegan products when I'm shopping at a retailer easily um also like people who are you know more environmentally conscious as well so I think like it really encapsulate encapsulates all of this um lastly I would say when I've gone to some you know talks or talk to some brands uh, who are looking to promote themselves in retailers still in bricks and mortars they said that even if they have a large um, shade range etc that um, you know they have to pay a lot for space let's say in booths or super drug etc and that's too much money for them so they they like to like only kind of put the top sellers there um, so I think like maybe retailers also have a part to play in that and think about, you know, yeah. how to allow access to more people. And the last thing is also in the media. So interestingly enough, um, you know, we we as women, many of us are on Instagram. And sometimes when I'm seeing a bronzer or something like this, um, I would like to know which one would work for my skin shade, my skin tone. And I think, you know, the media or videos have a part to play in that as well. However, I do think we're so much more inclusive than we were like 10, 15 mm-hmm. years ago. So I think we're totally on the right track. Yes, for sure. But we still have a lot of work uh, to do, uh, I would say. Aisha, uh, can we hear from you uh, on sure. this? I, I echo the sentiment of Nippy, Lauren, and Nadima. And I think, you know, the only thing additionally I will say, and this comes from my background as a banker, is that I always follow the money. That's kind of what I think about. And even before, you know, the murder of, of George Floyd, a couple of years ago, I attended um, a big beauty conference and mm-hmm. all of the leadership of the major beauty legacy companies were actually white male, yeah. <laughs> right? And these are the products that are predominantly geared, again, I, I understand the concept around gender inclusivity, but predominantly ge- geared towards women, people who identify as women, right? And so I want to talk about inclusivity from a financial standpoint. And just like Nadima said, you know, how do you grow? You scale through distribution. Well, if you get to a retailer, yes, we're talking about a 15% pledge, but still, I mean, I think Sephora just did this whole aisle of their black owned brands. I think they don't own up to 10 black owned brands in Sephora, right? So when we're talking about inclusivity, I think on a surface, on the surface, when you think about things, when you look through magazines or you look on Instagram, every single brand has a woman of every shade, right? So I feel like from hiring the right models and how you look on the outside, everybody's understood that inclusivity is the game. But when you go behind the the surface, you know, the black squares, when you get behind, who is actually making money? Who is actually getting the capital to scale? Who is actually getting the shelf space, which is highly correlated to capital? It is all not inclusive. It in fact is probably 90% white. And of that 90% white, probably another 90% white male. So I think the low barriers to entry in the beauty industry, anybody can start a beauty company, right? With $5, sell a lipstick and set up an Instagram page, you have a beauty company. So when you think about the numbers, yes, it looks like we are inclusive, but when you go behind again, I always say, follow the money. You know, it is the economics of this industry are hugely skewed to white males. And until we start to change the way the capital is allocated in this industry, I think everything is performative. Oh, yes. Uh, we at Women of World Wearables have a lot of to say on that as well, because we were in conversation with, uh, you know, some uh, really high position executives in beauty companies. And just like you said, Aisha, you know, at the end of the day, uh, 80% or even 90% of them are white male, you know, and you're selling lipstick and makeup. And just like you said, I mean, of course, there are men who are interested in the beauty industry as well. But yeah, it, it can be uh, that statistic. I agree with you. Um, you. Some of you mentioned Fenty Beauty uh, as an example. So what are some of the good campaigns uh, that you uh, recently maybe discovered or some other brands that are using um, uh, inclusivity and diversity in a good way uh, that are authentic, what we just mentioned? Does anyone have to say something on that? Lauren, can we start from you? 
Yeah, sure. Um, you know, I think that Milk uh, Milk Makeup, Milk Cosmetics was one of the first brands that I can remember where I saw gender fluidity and um, more diversity. And it was the first brand I remember where it didn't look like a traditional beauty brand. Um, you know, I think MAC Cosmetics has been doing it for a long time. They look like a beauty brand, but I think they were really on the forefront mm -hmm. of um, inclusion in terms of like the non-standard approach to beauty. Um, I think, you know, about Fenty and their, their shade range, and like I mentioned, Universal Standard and their size range, I think there are a number of brands who are um, doing more, but just like we've talked, like it has to be consistent. It has to be, it can't just be in your campaign. It has to be yeah. woven into product design and how people access your brand. And it has to be woven into the DNA of who you are. And I think there are, there are brands where you can tell, like you can tell, you can get a sense of what's genuine and what's not. And, you know, some of those brands that I mentioned, I feel like they are really making an effort to do that. Um, and then I think you can see in the industry, especially online, has really dragged the ones who aren't, um, especially since this summer. And you can see when it's not consistent and when it feels like, you know, they posted a black square and then that was all they had to say about making sure that people feel welcomed in their community. Thank you so much, Laura. And we will talk more about, you know, uh, the importance of social media today and, you know, and how brands communicate uh, with their uh, customers and the relationship they have on there as well. But I would like to hear uh, from Aisha as well. Uh, do you have any good examples uh, that you recently discovered? You know, I'm- Or maybe I'm, bad ones, <laughs> you know? <laughs> I'm not going to say that. Okay. I'm not going to say that because, you know, the reason I'm not going to say that is I find that on social media, everybody gets on the bandwagon, right? Mm -hmm. It's like, okay, what's the great, it's like right now, it's stop Asian hate. And so everybody's pushing stop Asian hate. Prior to that, it was hire black creatives. And I feel like everybody just goes again, black squares or whatever they're doing. I don't, I don't look, I look beyond that. I look beyond that. And I, I think what, for me, what I find to be inclusive about a brand is a brand to me that almost has no color. And I have to say that for the longest time, for me, that was Mac, right? I actually never knew who was the founder of Mac or who was beyond behind Mac. I just knew that when I went to a Mac store, um, someone as dark as me found a home, someone on the other end of the pale spectrum and everybody in between, we found a home. And so for me, that's what I think is amazing. And Mac, I think Fenty Beauty does that really well. And I think that Fenty can do that because Rihanna is the name behind yeah. the brand. But we also don't know what the economics are for Brianna, let's be honest, right? We don't actually know if Brianna owns 95% of that company or 5% of that company, yeah. right? At least they've done a really good job at making everyone feel like they have a home in that brand. So I would say, you know, I never like to say who's really good at inclusivity, because even as I talk about Mac, I believe Mac is owned by Estee Lauder Company. But then last year, when the whole brouhaha started, you know, people started talking about Estee Lauder, how they were awful to work for, right? I mean, even Essence Magazine, which is an iconic beauty magazine that Black women, Black girls, me growing up, you know, Essence was like, I don't even know what to call it, right? And then to hear that Essence also had these issues. And so I'm reticent to respond to your question because I feel like it is constant work. It is constant work and I don't wanna hold anybody up as an example. And so the only thing that I wanna do is hold Bossy Cosmetics up as an example. And I wanna talk about what we are doing and how we are thinking about our imagery, how we think about hiring, how we think about our supply chain, because I can only speak for myself. I can't speak yeah. for anyone else. And, and you can set your own example. Yeah, exactly. I, I, I love what you said. Uh, Nibi? Um, I don't think I can add to much of what um, either Aisha Chu or Lauren just said, but I think that both examples, I was nodding when um, you mentioned Mac, because I had also recently been reading a lot, especially in the past couple of weeks of the Estee Lauder stuff, so I didn't want to um, bring that up. But I do know that, for example, if we're talking about Fenty, I know that we're looking at, um, it's obviously a very traditional French-owned company, it's owned by LVMH, um, mm -hmm. But I, I mean, I do know people who work at Fenty and from my understanding of their experience, it's that um, 
I mean, Rihanna is closer to the 50% mark. She, she's not a majority shareholder, but she is closer apparently. And, but then she also, what she, she also does tend to have um, an influence, an actual influence in the changes they make in the product design and stuff like that. So just for an example, when they first launched, and I was just um, excited because I was a Rihanna fan anyway, so I just wanted to go and try out the products. Um, the foundation that was, um, was available for my shade wasn't actually right because even though I'm dark skinned with um, yellow undertones and most dark, and they seem to go under the belief that most dark skinned people have red undertones, which isn't true. So they didn't have, um, for, so for a dark skinned person, it was only um, a foundation with a red undertone, but I got it anyway, because I just thought I wanted to try it out. But literally within three months, they had introduced like in between mm -hmm. shades of those, even those shades that they've done. So it's just, they, they are showing a quick response to just basically people's feedback. Yeah. They are actually targeting issues that, that, you know, come up. It's not just like, okay, we're going to do our 40 shades and this is a standard dark shade. So, so things like that, I do actually get, you know, I, I do get impressed with, because when I see that response to people's feedback, back and like Lauren mentioned just that even the gender fluidity so a lot of the influencers they work with they don't just work with women they work with you know all um you know just influencers all over the spectrum and that always they show how their shades work on all um shades of color so for me um I do see I'm not holding them as the gold standard but I do yeah. see that as an example of you know how some old white French men were basically able to adapt to you know, the current situation. Um, but as Aisha too also said, I think it's really important also just to focus on the brand that I'm working on, how I represent, and just basically what changes I'm making to you know, the status quo and the things I'm seeing that aren't right and you know, kind of changing what I can control. Yeah, hundred percent. But I like what you said, you know, about them, you know, taking customers' feedback into consideration and being really quick about making some changes. I think uh, that's really important as well. Constantly learning and uh, adapting and making new products, new solutions. That's really important. Nadima, if you have something to add, please do. We'd love love to hear from you. Well, I think um, when we think about inclusivity, it has to really be part of the whole spectrum. I have to say, like, there's some companies that might not be in color cosmetics, but, um, you know, there's a famous hair care brand, Function of Beauty, that allows you to kind of create your own hair care products. There's Curology, obviously, for skincare. I think that's great. Um, Philips launched a hair dryer that can kind of sense the moisture or the thickness of something of your hair like I really wanted to get it, it was super expensive so I didn't they should pr probably you know inclusivity should also include being able to shop at a normal decent price range um accessible yeah yeah accessible exactly so um you know at the, so there's definitely like a lot more happening in terms of that there's also Trini Beauty who launched uh you know beauty products which are quite smaller and that can be stacked and packed together and be multi-purpose so I think there's definitely a lot more happening but where I feel like um it's still very very poor is in the experience of the shopper so whether it's like shopping on the brand's website or still at the retailers. So I'm very shocked still, like even when I go to websites, like, um, well, I don't know if I can share it, but you know, just if you take the, the biggest ones, right? Like Superdrug or, mm -hmm. or Boots or something like that, you'd expect the experience to be so much better. I mean, they're a massive company with so much money, right? And developers. And you can see like startups who are more agile with maybe one developer creating an amazing experience. You think uh, you can get the same. But also when you shop at like brands, websites or retailers, you know, I could put a foundation in my basket um, for like my Indian skin tone or I could put something, you know, from some, some specific skin concerns I have. And then all my product recommendations will often usually still be for like white skin tone. And I'm just like, mm -hmm. you should know more about me by now. You know, like yeah. you know, when you have a coffee at Starbucks, that's personalized to me. It's like, you know, it has my name. Or when I listen to Spotify, it's got my music. And, you know, Amazon more or less can personalize stuff. And in beauty, which is the most personal category in the world that like we put on our skin and hair, it's still really, really lacking. There's a lot said in PR, but not a lot done yet. So I think that shopping experience for every customer needs to be a lot more inclusive and not just be set to default to wherever the country is and the bigger population. 
Yes, and I think that we all experienced that, especially during the pandemic, you know, when all the stores were closed and you couldn't go to store to pick your uh, favorite shade or, or the new shade that you would like uh, to try on. So everybody was buying online. So this is also something that I would like to talk to you about. How has the pandemic affected the beauty industry in general, uh, but also how has the pandemic affected your uh, businesses? I know from my experience that, you know, I definitely focus more on my skincare routine. I tried Korean skincare routine, but I lose, I use uh, less makeup. How has the pandemic affected uh, you? Lauren, shall we start from you? Sure. Um, yeah, I'm very much the same. I wear, I am a makeup junkie and during the pandemic, I just wore makeup less and focus more on skincare. So I think there are definitely like consumer habits that are changing. Um, as you mentioned, we saw a huge surge of e-commerce um, mm -hmm. because that was really the only option for a long time. And so there's always been this looming question in the industry of like, what's the future of e-commerce and will people buy everything online? Um, and I think we saw that happen a little faster. Um, that progression has started to happen a little faster because of the pandemic. Um, for our business, we, we had highs and lows. We had, you know, supply chain disruptions, just like probably every business did who sells a product. Um, but we were really fortunate to be able to write it out. I think one of the really interesting consumer habits that changed is that our primary product is deodorant. And a lot of people are nervous to make the switch to natural deodorant because of the social consequences of like, does it work? You know, they've, they've been um, failed in the past. And so with the pandemic and particularly in quarantine, people decided to make the switch to natural deodorant because they could very privately make that transition um, and figure out what works for them and let their body adjust without the social consequences that you know they had before. So that was, um, that was good for our business, but we definitely had our fair share of challenges um, along the way, you know, cost increasing, like I said, supply chain disruptions, many barriers. Um, but, you know, we were able to, to navigate those changes in consumer habits and, and kind of weather the storm. Thank you so much, Lauren, for sharing that with us. Aisha, how about you and, your, and Bossy Cosmetics? Sure. Um, you know, I would say the same of Lauren, you know, supply chain challenges. You know, my supply chain starts in China, where my primary packaging is made. I have a formulation mm -hmm. lab in, in Italy, and then my products, uh, my warehouse is here in California. And, you know, and as everyone knows, you know, China was ground zero, and then it moved sort of to Italy. And my lab is literally in northern Italy. So <laughs> the exact part of Italy that was locked down is where my products are all formulated. So it was a lot of anxiety <laughs> in, mm -hmm. in March and April of, of last year. And to be honest with you, I thought we would go out of business because um, I, I also didn't know whether the world was coming to an end. Um, mm -hmm. I can be kind of dramatic in that way. Um, but, you know, we're still here. Thankfully, we managed to work our way through our supply chain challenges. And, and what we actually did was lean into community. We leaned into the few thousand women who had already bought our products, you know, that, that then it became over 10,000 women who followed us on social media and really understood and connected with this message around confidence building, right? And confidence building with makeup or without makeup. So I basically had to say to myself, listen, if I'm going to have to pivot out of makeup, that might be what I'm going to do, but I don't want to lose, as I said, we are really a women's empowerment business, right? And so you can always work on championing and igniting confidence in women with or without makeup. Now, what ended up happening for the positive is that when our supply chain challenges started to ease, what we found, I mean, our sales grew, our base business almost tripled last year. And so what we found is that self-care and wellness continue to be important to our customers. And many of our, our customers are working women. We call them bosses. They're working women and they were all on Zoom. And so many of them were looking for a, a, a bright red now where they're going to show up in Zoom and make this presentation or, you know, really great eyeshadows. And so we found people really wanted to play with makeup to take their minds away, at least have a brief respite from what's going on in the world. So our business did grow and, you know, 2021 continues to grow. And, you know, I read an article yesterday that Walmart just reported an 80% pop in lipstick sales. 
And so, you know, we have, we've been really fortunate. I mean, we were featured on The View in February. You know, we basically crashed our site and it was all lipsticks that, that people were buying. And so it's been a really exciting time for us to continue to develop new products outside of lipsticks. We're expanding an eye now because people are wearing masks. But many people are taking the vaccine and choosing not to wear a mask, or at least to have a liquid lipstick underneath that's matte. So it's a really exciting time for us. We, we continue to kind of work on both fields, which is selling really amazing vegan, high quality products, but also like, how can we inspire you? How can we help you think around building your own confidence in your own level of journey? So it's been a, you know, we went, I went like this emotionally when the pandemic we started. We all did. Yeah. I mean, it was a roller coaster ride. <laughs> I literally was like, not only is my business crashing, my whole life is crashing, right? So um, that I'm on this Zoom call with you guys today, I think is just, you know, a miracle. <laughs> That's what we were discussing before we started this, uh, this panel discussion. Like, we are so fortunate that, you know, pandemic did bring us all together. So, you know, with online events, uh, we are now able to gather so many people from around the world, you know, around one topic, one panel discussion. Uh, and that's been amazing. And that's been incredible. So yeah, thank you for sharing that Aisha Nidima. Um, so for, for, for me, it's been a bit of an interesting journey. So just kind of to recap what we do, so it makes more sense. Um, so we offer uh, beauty brands, retailers, and pharmacies a technology so that they can better personalize, predict, and recommend products to their customers. Mm -hmm. Kind of like we call ourselves like the Netflix for beauty. So whether it's the product recommendations on the product page or checkout page, et cetera. So, and then we have a second thing that we sell is a digital beauty assistant. So it's not just a beauty quiz where you answer questions. There's a lot more to it than that. So obviously, given the pandemic and the store closures and the acceleration of online, it actually initially really helped our business. I was like really happy. That's how I signed all my first few clients. Um, you know, we signed Douglas or bigger than Sephora. I mean, it just really helped a lot uh, with the business. So that was great. The bit that was not great was that I really wanted to capitalize on this, like, Obviously, COVID sucks. I haven't seen my family for a year. Um, but I really wanted to capitalize on it. So I spent a lot of time fundraising. So I did, like, I'm sure we'll talk about fundraising later. So I'll probably share more of that journey a bit later. But that process just took so long. And like most founders will know, like, sometimes you can either focus on building your business mm -hmm. or fundraising. Thing. And that really, really slowed my business down a lot for a big period of time to the point where I was like, okay, I've done what I can for the fundraise. Now I'm just going to focus on sales again. And again, a lot of companies are investing, um, you know, in accelerating e-commerce and digital, etc. So it's also become a more competitive space, if I'm being honest. Um, so us being niche is actually being very helpful because we build a solution specifically for the beauty industry. But I guess it, I can resonate a bit with Aisha because it's kind of been like really high and then really low and then high. And it's, yeah, like every other entrepreneur, to be honest. <laughs> yes, we will definitely touch upon more about the fundraising journey. And that's precisely the reason why we decided to organize investing in fundraising this time in Haltech and uh, Femtech. But there will be a couple of additions. Uh, for sure, because uh, fundraising can sometimes be a full-time job, just like you said. And to that, to that point, deciding whether you're focusing on building a company or fundraising for the company. So yes, uh, we, we will touch upon that a bit later. Nibi, can we hear from you? Yeah, sure. I definitely resonated with um, a lot of what everybody said. Um, Aisha, I'm glad I'm not the only person who wondered if the world was going to end um, because I, I was also quite dramatic. And to what Lauren said about deodorant, it's really funny. I was literally just saying to somebody that um, I just have to remind myself to wear deodorant. Now, after a year of living on my own, I just didn't bother. <laughs> so now I have to get back into that habit. But um, no, just before the pandemic hit, we were actually... Um, like poised to go into brick and mortar so we were going to open our first um space in lagos um which is where i am now and we basically um we wanted to create a space that was basically a better like black hair experience so 
somewhere that you go, you book an appointment, the appointment is actually on time, you get there, you're not there the whole Saturday, you don't have some, and just to create uh, this, you know, space that you go in, get your hair done, you leave. And then this, we literally just signed a lease on um, our space and then the pandemic hit and everyone was at home and we were just like, oh, what are we gonna do? But then that was actually what, um, that the whole, what we're doing now, working with AI and uh, machine learning, which is actually quite similar to what um, Zima is doing. Um, at the moment, we just have a quiz on the website, which is just basically um, for data gathering purposes. But um, eventually, it is, we are trying to create a platform that is hyper personalized that, um, you know, someone, I don't know how much anybody knows about the textured hair um, experience, but basically, people find themselves wading through tutorials or wading through like just looking at loads of different products that aren't going to work for them because it's not their own hair properties. So we're trying to create like their own personal space. So it's basically like going through all their YouTube tutorials or, or the product recommendations and everything will work for them based on their own um, hair properties. Um, so, but that idea only came because I, I wasn't able to go out and meet people. I wasn't able to do the in-person consultations anymore. And um, we did try some online um, consultations and then I just realized that that wasn't scalable because it would require me cloning myself several million times. And so this idea kind of grew out of that. So while the pandemic has been horrible for so many mm -hmm. reasons, um, at least it's um, helped me kind of think bigger um, and just explore possibilities that I hadn't actually even thought of when I was on this one track mind of we're going to have a, a chain of, you know, essentially yeah. natural hair blowout bars. It, it's really, and it just kind of opened up the market as well. So it's not focused on going one market at a time. We it can open up globally just in one, in one go. So it, it's been great in that sense. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Nibi. Uh, Lauren, uh, my next question is for you. Uh, I would say that as consumers, we are becoming more and more aware about, you know, what we put on our bodies, what we eat, we read the ingredients on the food that we eat, we read the ingredients on, you know, on the products that we use for our, uh, skin and for uh, bodies. So how are you uh, at each and every tackling the issue of educating everyone about the importance of what you put uh, on your body, on your uh, skin. Uh, how important is the education and how are you uh, doing it? Yeah, a lot of what we do is education. Mm -hmm. We hear um, from consumers all the time that it's confusing. It's hard to know what you're putting on your body. Even if you can read a label, what do those chemical names mean? Um, yeah. And why does coconut oil have a really complicated chemical name that doesn't sound like coconut oil? Um, and so really our attempt is to demystify that um, and really enable people to make informed choices by giving mm -hmm. them more information. I think the industry has been um, protected by trade secrets for a long time. And that has led to a lot of secrecy around what's actually in our products, but consumers want to know more, they want to be educated. And so we really try to demystify that, whether it's through educational blog posts or even our packaging, you know, on our packaging, we provide what the like regulated chemical name for an ingredient is, and then what the simple name is. So you know what you're getting, even though it sounds really complex. Um, we use a lot of essential oils. Some of the essential oils have allergens because they're natural you know, components. And we disclose those on the packs so that people know if they're buying a product with allergens on them. I think, you know, previously that would have been um, not something you would see a lot from brands because there's a lot of secrecy and lack of transparency. And we really try to bring transparency to the forefront um, so that people can really make informed choices about what they use. Yeah, I would say that before, you know, you would know if there's an allergen uh, after you had your uh, reaction. reaction. Yeah, yes. and it's true. I mean, everybody responds differently to different ingredients. So there's yeah. there's never going to be a guarantee that, you know, you won't react to something. But we feel like the most, you know, the least step we can do is provide you with information um, so that you know what you're putting on your body. You may not know you have an allergy to something, but then if you do have a reaction, you can probably trace it back to one of the ingredients. is being like oh it must be this product without knowing exactly yeah and also just like product. you said it's not enough to just read the ingredients it's also very important to know what these ingredients are you know mm -hmm. behind uh, all the names uh so that's really important thank you uh, for that lauren uh 
I, I, I would like to start the topic of, we are getting here to discuss inclusive beauty and uh, beauty technology. So I think it's time to talk more about the technology in the beauty industry. So my next question is for, uh, for Nidima. You already said that you're Netflix for beauty. And I know that on Netflix, I get personalized recommendations, you know, what to watch next. Uh, based on your previous watch list, this show will be 80% uh, fit for you. Uh, can we talk more about the need for more personalized approach uh, in the beauty, how technology can help to achieve that? And also about ditching the one size fits all approach, which I'm sure we all know that it's not working anymore. It's such a long subject. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm also really curious about what you're watching on Netflix now. Um, okay. <laughs> I can give you some recommendations. <laughs> I just think I've run out of stuff to watch. Um, okay, so look, of course, like everybody knows about this, one size, you know, fits all. Okay, I, I don't really know what was the best English expression. It's my third language, but uh, you, you get what I want to say, right? Um, so the beauty industry as a whole is facing some specific challenges and a little bit more um, for the beauty industry than others. So beauty is like the fastest growing category in let's say social media or YouTube. It's the category that makes the most amount of money for YouTube and for Instagram. So paying influencers, paying social media is very expensive and then you're paying PPC. So it's all these brands or retailers who've gone now DTC are spending a lot of money to get traffic onto their website, right? Mm -hmm. But then lower down the funnel, they're not converting them. And that's a huge issue because the way you're getting traffic keeps uh, growing. I mean, the cost keeps growing, but converting them into customers keeps decreasing. And um, one of the reason is people can now shop, people are just a lot less loyal. You can shop from like, obviously the Amazon, you can shop from each other, <laughs> right? <laughs> Whether it's like on eBay or whatever. People Facebook are generally place. Yeah, and people are also often spending less actually on uh, products and more on experiences. If you look at, you know, the spending culture from Visa and their insights, you will see that people are generally spending less on material stuff. And then people can buy from a brand, a retailer, et cetera, in store. So it's very difficult to get the customer to keep coming back to the website. So beauty industry is having a big challenge that the cost of getting a customer is increasing but the customer lifetime value is decreasing, right? So that's a big thing. The second thing is really on the retention front. I believe Aisha or somebody on this panel talked about it as well. Retention is definitely a big issue in the beauty industry. There's new and new brands launching all the time. Like Aisha mentioned, you know, you can launch a lipstick for like very little money. Then you've got celebrities launching their brands, Rihanna, you know, Charlotte Tilbury, et cetera, et cetera. So, Retention is definitely a big issue. The third big issue I would say in the beauty industry is the technology. So what I mean by that is, you know, all the tech teams have work that they were supposed to complete six months ago and they already have a roadmap of one year work to do. So if you're a startup, they might not have the technical know-how or the technical mm -hmm. team in-house. If you're a bigger company, there's so many decisions and bureaucracy and they're just not agile enough. So, you know, these are the three big challenges that the beauty industry is facing. So what we have seen is that technology has really been an enabler to scale and fix these kind of issues. So one, let's say for our pharmacy client, they, you know, between all of our clients using an AI solution that combines both beauty intelligence competitor intelligence, which I have for my first company, seven years of data, um, and also artificial intelligence, when you combine that together, so you can offer people and predict, going back to the whole Netflix example, what people want to buy. So if I'm shopping a dual product, like I'm in shock, you can go on some of the retailers, right? Like, if you're shopping or you're looking at product by Dior, you're probably more interested in, you know, luxury brand. If you're looking at a product like The Ordinary, you're probably more interested in a specific ingredient, specific concern. Mm -hmm. You might be sensitive to the price point. You might not be. And 
if you even watch Netflix, it can take forever to personalize it unless you watch it a lot like me. Or, <laughs> you know, so you also need <laughs> something like to boost it. So overall, it's not just about, oh, let's personalize the email. It's really about you have to personalize the shopping journey throughout whether it's for the skin tone, whether it's for the concern, whether it's for a preference for ingredient. I'm escaping London lockdown. I'm in Dubai right now. My skin has completely changed mm -hmm. at climate. In beauty, you also have to look at trends. You have to also look at seasonality. You know, people are shopping now more products with SPF if I'm in UK. So there's a lot of things you need to take into account. And it has to be real time and dynamic. So if I add something to my basket, like I was shocked. I was on this German retailer website. I added, like I said, you know, they're a big company. Like I added a foundation and then they were recommending me on the checkout page, five other foundations. So if I've just added a foundation in my basket, I'm obviously not going to be yeah. interested to buy five other foundations, right? And definitely not of a different skin shade. And oh, yeah. I, was, I was just completely shocked at the, the uselessness of this. And it would help the customer a lot. It would save me time and money. And it would help the brand and retailer make more money, right? Yes. And also, in terms of the digital diagnostics, there's so many companies now doing quizzes, um, you know, and it's kind of like a filter, which is a great start. But often it's not encapsulating, like it's not updating like Netflix does what you need to do. Sometimes, like I went on... One of the brands website mentioned here, I won't actually say the name, and it recommended me a product out of stock. I was just like, excuse me. So I think there's a lot still that needs to be done. And generally, if you do it right, like for Douglas, the retailer, we helped increase their average order value 35% in two months right? And that was testing our solution versus an existing generalist solution that wasn't beauty specific. And then the last thing I will say, sorry, it's a very oh, like, please don't worry. <laughs> passionate topic for me. The last thing I'd say in terms of like the technology, I think whether you're a startup or whether you're a retailer, and I learned this, especially with my first company, um, try not to build everything yourself try to like test, you know, capture data, see if it's working, and then, you know, try to perhaps, you know, build stuff. This is especially specifically true, not so much for startups who, you know, can be more agile, but like the companies like the Estee Lauders of this world or big retailers like Superdrug, et cetera. Um, I really, they've all like geared up so much their technical team, yet to launch anything takes so long because of yeah. the bureaucracy that, you know, they should think about buy versus build and how quickly they could test something if they just plug something in, um, it would help the customer and them. So I think there's a lot of challenges still that the beauty industry faces and personalization helps overcome a lot of that. And especially like you mentioned, uh, creating a really good experience is also important because if you've had a good experience, you know, the higher the chances are that you will return to that. Yeah. Uh, but, but it's not so sorry to cut you off i forgot to mention something important it's yes but also like the reason the average order value went up was because we were recommending more of the right products right yeah. so imagine every second or third customer that comes to your website as one additional product that's a big increase in revenue so if i'm now shopping let's say at fenty um i was maybe going to buy their foundation right but if I'm recommended the right products alongside it, I might end up buying two products. And then maybe I'll fall in love with not one, but two products of theirs. Yeah. And I would have never bought that second product if that second product was not recommended to me correctly in the first place. So now you have a chance of not me just coming back for the first product, but now you have a chance of me coming back to you and being a loyal customer for two products. And that is essentially how the whole retention chain starts. But also, but also maybe buying gifts for, you know, uh, some from your friends, your family members, you will definitely come back for more. I, yeah. I, I, I agree. Uh, I Nibi, sorry, sorry, sorry Nibi, go ahead. Just like one last thing, messaging is very important. So, you know, in Middle East, people, are, companies are messaging you on WhatsApp, obviously in China on WeChat. But even if you're sending people email, don't send me an email like these are best-selling shampoos. I really don't care. I've got oily hair. I want to know this is the best oily shampoo for mm -hmm. like I like. 
that way i'm not going to unsubscribe to my to the email and you're not going to lose me as a customer and you can improve the customer experience make more money make me happy and you know that's really good point and that's a really good point Nima. uh nibi you are also using ai and machine learning to create the personalized experience for anyone with texture hair and you mentioned here as well that your brand was born out of the frustration because you couldn't find suitable products on the market would you say that uh, things have changed on the market now or is it still the same? Yeah, um, things have definitely changed. Um, when I first um, when I first started King Apothecary, and it was just started because like everybody else on this panel, apparently I was also in finance, but um, I had moved to Nigeria and just couldn't find the products I needed. So it was just kind of like a side hustle. I was writing a hair blog and just bringing stuff in and that, um, looking at the Nigerian market, I just assumed like the rest of the world was, you know, kind of fine in terms of textured hair products. And I, I quickly discovered that, that it wasn't. Um, but in that time, um, about 10 to 12 years ago, there was a sudden boom of, um, you know, black women embracing their own texture, um, people with curly hair of all ethnicities, actually, who used to straighten their hair, um, were trying to embrace their own actual texture. And it kind of took off um, around the same, just around the same time as we were launching. And we were the first in Nigeria, but um, just in the UK and the US it had already kind of started, but it was really like growing legs. So in that time, so many new brands have come onto the market. Um, so many new products have come on. Um, a lot of the old established brands are now trying to some badly and some, some, <laughs> some, um, some a little bit better are now trying to get it um, into the um, textured hair industry by creating products specifically for textured hair where they weren't doing that before. Um, so in terms of are there more products? Yes, there are. But uh, is it easier for me? Is it um, any easier for me to kind of access them? Not always. So we still get um, even like I say, I've been based in Nigeria this whole time. On our social media, we get um, requests from people from all over the world saying, "Oh, do you do you ship to this country, like all over Africa, place, parts of Europe, and stuff like that?" So, which just suggests to me that they're still having that issue of accessibility. When I'm in the UK, I know that there are a lot of um, natural hair um, retail platforms coming up as well. But then that kind of being able to, if I'm working in the city and I'm commuting back home, just being able to pick up a product is still not um, still not that easy. Normally still have mm -hmm. to wait two or three days or cross town. Um, and then the newest problem is just the, the same problem that we've been talking about. The lack of personalization is actually a pretty huge issue because people are just wading through um, so many products. They don't, they're trying out stuff. They don't know what works. They're throwing things away. Um, and so, and I think the influx of new brands and new products has actually made that pro a problem a little bit worse. So people are just a lot more confused. People are still not like kind of just a bit clueless about what to get. So it's still, it has, it's changed in those ways. So yeah, more products, but also a bit more of a headache. Yeah, but it's moving into the right direction. Yes, it is. I mean, people are realizing that the need for personalization, as you say, and everyone, yeah. as um, Najima said earlier, everyone has a quiz. None of them, um, not all of them are as useful. I think, again, people have noticed that quizzes do well, so they're not always as useful as they could be. I, I remember once I went through an entire quiz and then I got to the end and it was like, oh, then you have to book something and pay. And I was just like, why do I just spend five minutes of my life just literally getting- Yes, yes, all, because all everyone life. should, yeah, everyone should warn you that, in the beginning yeah or a few times i've gone through and done the same answers a couple of times and then i get recommended different things as well so it's oh, like yeah. okay, how how real is this but um i think people are maybe that's just for a lot of people so even with our quiz it's just an mvp at the moment so it's literally just a plug-in it is quite detailed but it's not where it's going to be so maybe people are just using this as a first step to see you know how many people actually would find it useful or to gather data which is also good because it just means that there's development coming down the line as well thank you so much thank you so much anivi for your inputs aisha my next question is for you so for me personally and i know for uh, a lot of uh women lipstick is almost like a, this superpower uh, tool that can boost your confidence in a second, you know, when you put it uh, on. So I would like to talk to you more about launching a mission-driven brand 
and also about reclaiming the term bossy because sometimes it can uh, today uh, especially can sound a bit you know negative but you're reclaiming it sure i would like to know more yeah so it's funny because um people asked me in the beginning when we were launching the business are you sure you want to call your company a negative word like a word that you know people have decided they want to cancel the word yeah. um, and it's interesting right because i've now had the business for two and a half years and that's exactly what i think has really helped with our early success because it's almost jarring to people and it makes them like wait what um, and so what we've had to do is to take that wait what moment and to, and to be very impactful. And so when I say, you know, we're a mission driven business, why do we call ourselves bossy? Because when I was even just doing the research in the business, right, I understood that so many women today and when they were young ladies or girls were called bossy, right? And what I started to learn is that everybody had something in common around being called bossy. And it was generally, you were either too outspoken or you were speaking out of turn, or you had an opinion that somebody just quite didn't want to hear. It was always this notion around stop, right? Like you are just too much. And that's exactly what we were looking for as a brand. We wanted to speak to that young girl who is now a woman who may have been told stop, who may have been told you speak too much, who may have been told it's not your turn or you, it's not appropriate for you to voice your opinion here. That's exactly what we wanted to drill down. We wanted to drill down on that notion of being told to stop or being told to be quiet and to reclaim that, to say that when you were told you were bossy, don't internalize that as being something that was negative. Take that pejorative message and flip it and say, actually, this person may have been intimidated by me, or maybe my point was so amazing that they wanted me to shut up. Right. And so that's what we were really trying to do is to reclaim the word. And it's not, look, everybody go around yourself and call yourself bossy. So if you look at our logo, actually, it says bossy, but the Y is in a different color. So it's almost this flip on, I'm not bossy, I'm the boss. Right. And so that's exactly what the brand is trying to do. And I, to be honest with you, I was very nervous when we started about, wait a minute, am I creating a brand that people are going to be like, this is crap because of this negative association. But I feel really comfortable two and a half years into it that people have really understood what we are trying to do with using this otherwise pejorative term as really a rally cry for women to just always use your voice always work to get a seat at the table. And when you get a seat at the table, make sure people know you were there and make sure you make a space for somebody else. And lipstick has been for me, you know, I've always called myself a lipstick junkie. And all of my friends were like lipstick giving is almost like a gifting culture amongst mm -hmm. a number of my friends where it's like, I saw this badass red at the airport. I'm traveling. You know, I've got this client meeting. I'm super nervous. I'm going to wear this bright red. And I bought four and I send it to my friends. Right. And beauty has always been this thing. Um, for my friends where it's like, yes, we want to look pretty, but we're so much more than just how we look. But how we look is really important to us. Like we want to show up looking beautiful, but we want to feel beautiful so that when we are in that client pitch or when we are trying to get that job or whatever it is you're trying to do, we feel that confidence. And so bringing all of those things together is what the brand and the company is about. We started through lipsticks, and as I said earlier, we are expanding through eyeshadows and eyeliners and foundation, and you know, hopefully over the next 12 months, we will be full facial cosmetics company. But we started with lips because, you know, for a lot of women, I think somebody said it earlier, I think it was Nadima, around loyalty levels, right? I played on this notion that women have almost no loyalty at the lipstick level. Like the average woman who loves lipsticks has 10 different brands which means, but her foundation, she may only wear one or concealer only wear one, which means that the, at the point in facial cosmetics where she's willing to take a chance on a new brand that is founded by a non-celebrity, a non-influencer, basically, someone who has a hunch about something is lipsticks. And so that's really was our entry point, um, but we do wanna grow. And ultimately I see us going into, as I said, full facial cosmetics and skincare. Thank you so much, Aishu. Uh, I want to talk to you 
all about launching a business. You're all successful founders and you have amazing companies. And I know that in the audience, we do have some startup founders, you know, who are maybe thinking about starting a company or who maybe just launched the company. So what were some of the challenges that you went through uh, through your entrepreneurial journey? And what were some, you know, amazing things? If you have any interesting story to share with us, uh, please do. Lauren. Yeah, I am following the order from the photo. Yeah, yeah, that works. That works. Um, yeah, I mean, starting anything from scratch is hard. And so you have to have passion for what you're doing because there will be highs, but there will also be low lows that make you question like, is, is this meaningful? Like, why am I doing this? So you have to have passion. I think one of the things, one of the biggest challenges for me was just not having the expertise. Um, you know, I've been in the industry for 12 years, but I had predominantly built big brands for retail. I'd never sold a single product online mm -hmm. and I had no idea how to sell a product online. I built our first website by watching YouTube videos. Um, I designed ads using PowerPoint because I have no design skills. Um, so really just being scrappy in the beginning, um, it, that was a challenge, but it also really forced me to prioritize and get clear on like what was important. And it also forced a like learning culture so that I wasn't investing time and money in things that weren't important. One of my biggest philosophies even today is to start small and build incrementally over time because it can seem daunting when you're starting out that you've got to get everything perfect from the beginning um, and you've got to do all the things that you know brands that are larger than you are doing and the reality is you don't you have to start somewhere you need a lot of focus and you just have to start small and build incrementally over time and then bigger opportunities will come you'll get you know a bigger consumer base and you'll get opportunities to expand products and that doesn't all happen overnight um, you have to start somewhere and I think you know the same approach with fundraising like start with people who know you who share your vision and who believe in you as a person um, and then as you get velocity you'll get more opportunities and when you seek bigger opportunities you'll have more to show for that um, so I think that's really been something that's helped us overcome the fact that I had no expertise doing this mm -hmm. is that we just started really small and we're really focused and diligent about building over time. And, and uh, since you just touched upon fundraising journey, can you share a bit about your own fundraising journey? Have you raised any external money? Uh, how would you describe it? Yeah, it's, I mean, it's a learning process, honestly, like we still are learning a lot about it. Um, we have raised externally, mostly leveraging personal connections. Um, but it's something we're continuing to navigate. Like I resonated a lot with what um, Nadima said is when you're focused on, you know, getting the support you need for your business, you're not focusing on your business. So it's constantly a balance of, you know, trying to drive the business and get the results we need, but also get the support for the business that we need to. And I don't think there's a perfect way. I think everyone's journey looks different. There are a lot of ways to, to raise um, in today's environment. And you just, you got to try a lot of things and see what works for you. Thank you so much, Lauren. Aisha, what are your thoughts? What were some of the challenges in your entrepreneurial journey and your fundraising journey? Yeah. What were, or what are, <laughs> <laughs> this haven't stopped yet. If the rest of you have stopped experiencing challenges, I'm really happy for you. I'm still challenged. Um, you know, everything right but i do completely echo what lauren said in terms of starting small I, i've shared this before that when i was starting the company you know i was very naive i was like oh i'm just gonna go raise a couple million dollars yep okay put together a debt doo, 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 and go see a bunch of investors and that was a wild process considering the fact that i come from finance i was not you know completely a stranger to to the investment you know process but what what shocked me was how much of it was actually qualitative and subjective and had nothing to do with your idea. In fact, one of the biggest obstacles that I found in the process was the fact that I was Black, right? Which, you know, I'm visibly Black if you can't see me very well. Um, and, and one of the messages that I found investors themselves couldn't get past is I was communicating an investment opportunity that was really for, as I've said, self-identifying ambitious women around the world. And that has no color. But investors kept forcing me to, to, to make this a niche 
focus, right? It's either, but you must be targeting only black women or are you targeting only women of color? And when I talked about, you know, in, inspiration and all these things, investors could not grab, wrap their mind around a black woman creating a prestige beauty brand that was for all women, mm -hmm. right? And that she wasn't a Rihanna or a Pat McGrath. They did not see it as me being able to do it. And so I realized that, listen, you know, I was really passionate and I wanted to do it, but it was also affecting my confidence. And here I am selling confidence building, but getting my confidence destroyed. And so I just, I stopped at the beginning, right? I hadn't even launched the business. And I was like, okay, instead of trying to convince people that you as a black woman can build something that you want to build, why don't you start? And so that's been, it was, you know, I raised a very small amount of money through friends and family, and that's what's taken us to where we are now. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting what Nadima said, because I'm literally, I'm, I now, I just hired a business coach because I want to go back to those very same investors and some more, because now I'm ready to raise a big round because we are looking at some really large distribution opportunities and we can't kind of, you know, mom and pop it any longer. But now I feel a lot more, well, somewhat more confident in that I have the metrics, I have the traction, mm -hmm. I can show that some of these things that they didn't believe I could do in the beginning, we have done. And I do completely expect that they will push back on a million other things, right? And I'm prepared for it. What are you going to do? I mean, I'm all in, I'm 150% in to continuing to build behind the momentum of the business. But I do recognize that raising capital as a Black woman, you know, is awful, right? Less than 3% of, of venture capital money went to women. And I think of those women, you know, I don't know, like 2% went to black women. So I don't mean that's a rounding error. Mm -hmm. So I'm already starting off kind of in the back. Um, but, you know, as I always tell our customers, like, don't stop, go for it, put on a great lipstick and get yourself ready, be prepared, do the work and do it. And so that's what I and tell prove them wrong. Yeah, and prove them wrong. So, you know, I'm, you know, I've got to prove, I've, I've now said this here that I'm starting to fundraise. And so you guys hold me honest, but it hasn't been easy, right? And getting more products and in order to get into big distribution, they don't want you to sell only four lipsticks. They want eyeliners. They want this, they want that. You need money to get all those things. Nadima is talking about personalization. Well, you know, to afford Nadima's service, you know, is already, you know, you need capital. So everything starts, you know, to yeah. build a business, you need a team to have a team, you need to pay them. So it has been, and so when you say, what were the challenges? I'm like, Anya, I'm still on the challenge every single day, like website, tech, product, supply chain, you know, retailer relationships. I mean, when I, when I communicate with retailers, I always use the term we, 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 but we is me. Right. So it's, it's, whew, it's hard. But, but you, you are already there. I wanted to say you'll get there, but you are already there. And I have no, no doubts, doubts in you. Just go there and prove them wrong. Nivi. Uh, Hi, I'm here, but dealing oh, with um, electricity issues in Lagos. Great. Um, but Don't worry, Nivi. Don't worry, Nivi. If you cannot uh, answer us right now, we can go back to you. Is that okay? Nidima, can we hear from you maybe? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, you briefly touched upon a fundraising journey uh, before as well, but I would really like to hear your experience and some of the challenges you went through. I, I only mention here challenges because I think that, you know, from challenges is we learn from them. So I think it's really important to, uh, to share them as well, but you're also uh, more than welcome to share some amazing things or inspiring stories that happen in your entrepreneurial journey as well. I totally, but I totally agree with you. Like I hate it when I go, you know, someone meets me and they're like, how amazing is your business? I, I just want to ask them what's the most difficult part of your business because that's how I learn more. Right. And I think yeah. that that's really what we should be doing. And this is a um, women of wearables event where it's all about helping and educating, um, you know, between women. So um, I'd be happy to share some more uh, honest insights on that. Um, and just a quick shout out to Aisha or uh, any other startup here. We would do it. We would, we, we, it's based on usage. That's why we've got big companies like Douglas or part of the L'Oreal Accelerator, but we also have like tiny startups. And then for the startups, we do it at cost, but then we ask for like stuff back or whatever. So anyway, come back to that later. We can talk about that offline. Oh yes. Uh, We're doing business already. I like that. 
No. So, <laughs> um, look, for me, I, I resonate a bit with what was discussed here. Um, I, again, have a finance background as well. I really thought, like, I can do a financial forecast, you know, at, like, super easily. Um, and, yeah, I was very surprised how long it was going to take. So, initially, um, you know, I wanted to fundraise before building the product. I was like, look, I'm a second-time founder. I've got seven years' experience working with one of the world's biggest banks. I've done a beauty tech company. I've won this award for in Europe at the parliament. I've had press, da, da, da. This is my idea. This is my vision. These are all my contacts. You know, give me your money <laughs> you know, so I can build my dream. And when I was talking to angels or VCs, they were all saying, well, you know, we have other companies coming to us that already have traction. So, you know, why don't you come to us when you have a bit more? So I'm like, okay. So I'm like, okay, let's do what I can with some family and friends money, um, build some traction, get some information, get some metrics, you know, get like clear demand, etc. We won the AI award for best customer experience for all of Europe, beating Zalando and Accenture. So like all this stuff really, really helped. Then I was like, okay, now I want to fundraise. And very similar to Aisha, you know, it's very different fundraising. This has been talked about a lot, but it's so true as a woman versus a man. So I'm very well connected with the tech founders, whatever group in London. And I literally have mates who had fundraised 8 million pounds to launch a skincare brand without having any skincare experience, without even having the website launched, without even having the product <laughs> made, and including VCs had invested in that. And here I was with like names like Douglas, you know, L'Oreal, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I thought it'd be really quick and easy for me, but it was really, really not the case whatsoever. So first with COVID, um, I didn't really uh, expect uh, there'd be so much pushback from angels, but it makes sense because they were being a bit more, you know, a lot of angels lost a lot of their money in the stock market and this and that. So there's a lot less capital available initially. VCs, however, still have to deploy their capital. So if anybody's looking to fundraise from VCs, it would make sense. But I didn't really want to do a seed round from a VC, and I'd probably like to avoid VCs as long as I can. So I was going for angels, but I truly believe uh, your team is what will make or break your company. It's not the idea, it's the execution. Mm -hmm. So for me, I've got some shit hot advice. Sorry, I don't know if I can swear. I've got some really hot advices, you know, in terms of tech, uh, sales, et cetera, et cetera. And I really wanted my lead investor to be incredibly strategic. So I talked to so many companies, um, so many funds, and I was getting so much opposite advice. Like I would talk to, um, for instance, I'll just say it in case anyone here is interested. I'd be talking to her Labs and they have a whole process and the people vetting the business are people who are doing R&D for products. And I was like, huh, this doesn't make sense. And they would give me one comment. Then I'd go through like this French network of like, you know, high net worth individuals. They would tell me whatever the first company hated, they would tell me that's their favorite thing. So you just get so much opposing advice. And it was just like really doing my head, to be mm -hmm. honest. Um, and then after four months, I went through, I think, seven, eight interview processes. It was incredibly grueling. It was looking at the deck, looking at the forecast, interviewing my CTO, um, getting my CTO then interviewed by another AI developer of a company that raised 40 million. <laughs> you know, um, checking our recommendations with Sephora so they could see Sephora's recommendations are actually nothing in comparison to what we have, really building that trust, etc. It was nearly as if all my experience and all my network, you know, of five, six years didn't even count. And I yeah. think a lot of that is because I was a woman. And, you know, that really affected things. So after all this, I got a very amazing um, strategic investor who's the ex-global CEO of Jimmy Choo, the ex-global CEO of Dior Beauty, et cetera, et cetera. So that was very good. And he helped me a lot with the sales strategy. Once I locked him down, I was like, oh, the rest of the raise will be a no-brainer. Obviously, I've got someone who's done an IPO, who's run like one of the world's biggest beauty companies, I have him as a lead investor. He's invested in other startups. 
um, he got other Series B SaaS business partners to interview me because he really wanted to be very certain. I was like, this is a no brainer, but no, mm-hmm. it just didn't happen. And I think I spent another two, three months and it's not like it would never happen. But at that point, I was just like, I could have spent the same amount of time doing sales and have made more money and have yeah. got more clients. So for me personally, it makes more sense. My father has some businesses, he never raised a penny. And I think we see a lot in the press about raising money. And I think it's great to be able to hire the right talent, but sometimes it's not needed to raise that much money. For sure. For sure, maybe not even raise at all, you know, you, how much you raise shouldn't be the metric of success. It's a great thing for some businesses, but some businesses don't even have to, you know, raise external money. I have friends who like raised and then they had an opportunity to sell their business and get like 2 million each or 3 million each and the investors just completely vetoed it. So there's a lot of plus and minuses to both. Um, but kind of with what Aisha said, like we're now going to build even more traction and increase our revenue a lot more. And then we will go raise again. Um, and I probably still won't raise that much. I'll probably just raise to hire some key people and that's mm-hmm. it. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Nidima. Let me just check if we have uh, Nibi with us. Hi, Nibi. I yes. am back. But also I've just... <laughs> Sorry, I'm in Lagos. So everyone who doesn't know the electricity situation here, um, we have a lot of changeovers from the national grid, I guess, to generate. And I've just heard a bell, which means it's going to switch back. But anyway, I'll, <laughs> I'll try and answer the question. I missed a lot of what Aisha said and um, what Nadima said. But could you just, was the question was- Yes, what, the, what, 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 what was it like launching a business for you? What were, you know, some highs, some lows, some challenges you went through and experiences with fundraising journey? Yeah, so um, the biggest challenge is also seeing as I started in Nigeria, as you can see, infrastructure was one of the biggest challenges. But then as I think both um, the others just said, um, team is a huge challenge. So if you, if you can't get your team, and especially as a solo founder, if you can't get your team right, it's like impossible to execute. And I've been through so many people who just started promising and then... Um, this is in terms of both advisors and actual employees. Um, and it seems like the relationship is going to be, um, you know, good from the beginning and then things just happen and then you're trying to give it another chance. Um, and then I had to quickly learn that once you see that a relationship isn't going well, it just has to, you just have to like cut ties really, really quickly and just find somebody. Cause once you have somebody kind of slowing you down or somebody who doesn't really kind of share mm-hmm. your vision or, just isn't really helping you along the way. It can be really, really detrimental. And I had that issue for, for quite a while. Um, so we're going again, but we might be back. <laughs> <laughs> no worries, oh Nimi. It's a nightmare. Anyway, um, so we should be set for a bit. But um, so that, yeah, team, I think was the biggest thing. Second was the fact that I started everything kind of the wrong way around. So it was started kind of as a hobby and things kind of took off before I had structures in place. So that was a bit of a nightmare. And so if I did it again, I would really kind of focus on getting a strategy in place. Like, and mm-hmm. you know, I'm an accountant. I should have known better and I should have taken the time to do this, but to have some sort of plan in place, I know you don't um, stick to plans and that, you know, they're there, but if you, you just kind of need to have an idea of where you're going, how much money you're going to need um, and everything before you just like kind of get stuck into things. And I kind of did it the wrong way around and it took a while to kind of get things moving. So I had like a uh, like pretty big community um, that needed or like expected us to act like a big company when essentially it was just me and a small retail team and we couldn't move fast enough and we did a lot of the time we did disappoint our customers and things like that. Whereas if we had done it the other way around and I kind of knew, put stuff in place before we were like on social media and talking to people and like promising stuff, it would have just been um, a lot smoother. Um, And then in terms of fundraising, um, I haven't actually fundraised. So we bootstrapped um, Mm -hmm. pretty much this entire time. We made, when we were just um, retailing, we made a um, revenue from that and just plugged it back into the business. Um, Mainly because our biggest costs were actually inventory and it just wouldn't make sense to raise dilutive funding for, um, you know, for inventory at that point. Um, And um, also explored um, some other non-dilutive funding. So like cheaper sources of um, finance, like loans, um, now exploring 
grants now that um, we're launching in the UK, um, but then looking to raise later this year mm -hmm. as well. So um, based on the stories I've heard both today and just in general, it's not something I'm really looking forward to, but yeah, it's just... That's cool. But all the pain will be worth it. You know, you with that money, you can grow your company and you can grow the business. So in the end, I would say that it is worth it. All the pain. <laughs> and it comes with the learnings too. It does. Um, it looks like it does from Nadima's stories as well. So yeah. Uh, thank you so much, Nibi, for sharing that. I just want to briefly check with Maria if we have any questions. Uh, I don't want to miss questions from the audience, but if we do not, I still have we don't have questions from the audience. If anyone has questions, please do share them in the chat box. But Anya, we definitely can uh, continue with one or two more of your questions. Yes, 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 yes. I do have more questions. Uh, and we uh, briefly tackled on the topic of influencers and uh, social media, but especially for the beauty industry, social media has become really, really important um, channel. And I know you're all very active on Instagram, especially. So I would like just, you know, to briefly talk about how important is the social media today when launching a business, uh, the role of influencers that they have today, not, not only, you know, about uh, maybe recommending some products to buy, but uh, also setting up, you know, beauty ideals uh, as well. What are your experiences? And also to everyone who's listening, please make sure and go and follow uh, all our speakers and their companies on social media. Can yeah. we start? I, I, say I can start if you want. Yes, to start again. yes, perfect. <laughs> uh, yeah, we social media is critical to our business, um, mm -hmm. both from a paid standpoint and an organic standpoint. Like it is how people find out about us um, and it's also how we grow community. And so it's re it's been really important for us. I obviously am a consumer of social media. I didn't know a lot about social media um, advertising, um, particularly. I knew organic just because, like I said, I'm a consumer of it. So I know what content I like to consume. Um, but that was one of the areas where I didn't have the expertise. And then eventually, after I stopped building my own ads in PowerPoint, I was able to hire some of that expertise. And now we have an extended team, including partners who have really taught us a lot um, in this space and, you know, are really great about finding partners who are the right fit that we can continue to um, you know, leverage and partner with as we grow the brand. It is, it's an ever-changing world. There are, I tell the team all the time, I'm so exhausted by all the new platforms that come up that we now need to have an organic presence on. Mm -hmm. um, it is exciting, but it's also very daunting to have to, you know, maintain a, an organic presence on so many different platforms. I'm so thankful for our team for um, really digging in and taking a strategic approach to, to all of those platforms. And, you know, it's not without challenges. We get um, shut down all the time. We get, I have rejected ads in my inbox all the time. Um, sometimes it's just glitches and we can work through them. Sometimes it's our fault. Um, we have a, a scent that's cannabis and green tea and sometimes it'll show up in a family product shot and you can't advertise cannabis. And so the whole thing gets rejected. So it's something that is, you know, really critical for our business, but also um, isn't without challenges, especially, you know, in, um, you know, the last couple of months as or actually within the last couple of years as more privacy regulations have come out, um, being able to find consumers who would be interested in your brand is getting more and more challenging. And so we are, we're really focused on, um, you know, expanding our media presence beyond social. Social will always continue to play a role for us, but, when it's bad, it's really bad. And so we've got to diversify um, how people find out about us so that we aren't reliant on only one channel, but it's yeah. been a real, um, it's been a real catalyst for how people find out about us today and something that I think will always be a priority for us. But it has also become a very expensive, I would say, it, you know, uh, to target yeah. uh, customers and customers And it's very volatile. It's hard to predict. Yeah. I mean, yeah. forecasting out our business, we forecast based on previous data. And it's really hard to forecast forward when costs fluctuate as much as they do. So um, that is a that is a really big piece of it that is challenging. Thank you so much, Lauren. Yep. Aisha, any thoughts on this? Yeah, I, I mean, social media is, is super important to us. Um, I think each of them, each of the major platforms to a different degree, um, but it's really stressful, I've got, I've got to say. And what's, what's stressful about it is that sometimes it feels 
that you work for the platforms as opposed to you're working for your business because it's just a constant you know you need to keep constantly feeding this beast and every at the end of every quarter we we, we take a look at the data and we see what drives conversions and it's really interesting to me because our top driver of conversions is our email marketing Mm -hmm. Our second driver of conversions is organic traffic. Now, obviously, it's very difficult to really peel behind the curtain of where organic is coming from because somebody could hear about you on social media and then Google you later. Um, so that's been really difficult to dig into. So I kind of look at social media as it's where you have to play. Um, we have not traditionally been great in TikTok. We're trying to really grow in TikTok now. Um, so I would say Instagram and TikTok are really two areas where we really see as a part of our future. Um, Facebook is really for us more for paid advertising um, on there. Um, LinkedIn has been a really good uh, channel for us because we share a lot of articles, podcasts we like. We do a lot of blogging, guest blogging. So LinkedIn has been a really great channel for us based on the on the type of woman that we're focused on and the topics that we cover. But sometimes it can really feel like you're spending a significant amount of time on, on social. And so I've just brought someone on board to really help take over um, this content creation beast, as I call it. Um, you know, what my involvement in social has really been about, and you talked about influencers, you know, we don't have the, the budget to pay, you know, a huge influencer. Mm -hmm. What's been really beautiful for us is not only do we get a lot of user generated content so women who who buy the product and send us pictures so that's been really good for us um, we also work with some really small micro influencers who just love our product and they've really become friends of the house so i feel like we co-create with them i'll ask them what do you think about eyeshadows what's good like what are the ingredients what do you like and they really help me as a founder think about product development they're always doing you know how-to videos get ready with me videos sending me pictures Pictures. So we work with really, because again, we don't have a massive budget. So we work with really small influencers, but they've been wonderfully supportive of the brand. And, and that's what we'll continue to do. We'll, you know, obviously. And, do and sometimes, do. sometimes small influencers are also more influential than, influential than the big influencers, you know, among their never, community as well. Never worked with a big influencer, so I can't. I can't. <laughs> But our small influencers have been amazing. You know, they're so easy to work with. They bring a lot of really authentic followers to us, people who really love the brand, love what we stand for, want to try out the products. So they've really been a huge partner for us. So I don't want to, you know, I mean, one day we will blow up and I don't, I will always work with women like that because they literally are the bedrock and foundation of a lot of the content and the feedback that we have gotten as a brand. So social is important to us um, and we will forever remain on social, but I'm really questioning, you know, the amount of energy that I personally put into it. As I said, it is number four. Number one is email. Number two is organic search. Number three is referral, <laughs> mm -hmm. right? So when we are in Marie Claire, when we are in Essence Magazine, when we're in any of these magazines, the referral traffic that comes through that is the third. So when I think about where I need to deploy my energy, right? Because ultimately I'm a businesswoman. <laughs> you know, I'm not in this to just have my face on Instagram all day. I want to create products that people want. I want to create experiences that people find special. I want people to feel seen by the brand. And if they're being seen and they feel special through directly on our website and the articles that we write and, you know, the, the email newsletters that we send out, then we will continue to invest in those areas. Thank you so much, Aisha. Nibi. Hi. Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. Nibi, 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 you can go as well. <laughs> Okay, so um, I echo a lot of what Aisha just said in terms of, it's exactly the same for us in terms of where um, conversion comes from. Um, obviously, like you said, we are active on social media, active on Instagram. It's, um, and because I um, handle the Instagram a lot myself <laughs> um, over the years, and we've, we've, you know, we've worked with teams on and off, we've had people come in house on and off, um, it's been quite sporadic, so it hasn't been driven to, um, you know, as far as, as it can go. But that is not where most of our conversion traffic comes from. Um, 
And a lot of the people um, we find that with Instagram, people who are coming and looking for us on, or you know, interacting with us on Instagram, tend to be people who like the, you know, just want the inspiration, want the. It's it's more the community. They're from all over the world. Mm-hmm. They're not necessarily our actual customers at the moment. So yes, yeah, so our um, traffic really comes from, you know, our newsletter. It does come from um, from doing SEO. It comes from um, just referrals as well. But um, we actually started off, like, like I said, back in the day when we, we kicked off, we started off using, um, on Facebook, we didn't even have a website. We, I literally just started a Facebook page and that's how the whole community kind of, kind of kicked off. So it, to say it isn't important would be you know, wrong. It is extremely important. It's just not the biggest driver. Um, but just to um, talk about the fact about influencers, there's actually data to show that micro influencers, the people who have a thousand followers actually have the most engagement. So they have the most engaged following um, and they are actually the best people to work with in terms of um, converting, just in terms of driving loyal followers to, um, you know, to your brand. And we have worked in Nigeria with some bigger influencers, not... Uh, and they weren't paid a lot of the time, it was just through personal relationship, but there were people who have close to a million followers. Mm-hmm. Um, we do something with them. We'd get a bunch of, um, you know, people would start following the brand or we'd get a couple of sales after that. And suddenly they would start dropping off because they weren't interested in us as a brand. Mm-hmm. It was just that they're, somebody they were following, a huge person, celebrity they were following said, do this and you'll win this. And then they followed us and they weren't really interested in the content. So I think actually it is um, very, just, imp- I, I think it is, better to value that I do value the micro influencers a lot more than you know working with with a bigger one um, and then um, but another one that um, that we are now working with is actually Clubhouse and I know it's quite new I know there are not that many people on it but it's been really good for getting um, feedback from people mm-hmm. so when we start rooms and I say oh, um, we're just trying to just trying to get um, feedback on a certain either product that's going to launch or just a problem people are having and people are actually very open to sharing so it might be a small room but it's literally just like a focus group we're working with people from all over the world um, and they and we finding we're finding synergies and problems that people have had and um, and it's really actually helped us in the past couple of months and I'm actually a clubhouse creative first finalist just in, by the way wow <laughs> random I applied for it and just kind of ended up so we're, we're actually doing a program called history of hair which is now um being plugged into our greater like go-to-market strategy so it's, it's been great for for that as well so I think that's one that people need to look at too thank you thank you so much Nibi yeah yeah we are on Clubhouse but not very active on there as well there are so many channels today to keep track of and be active on uh, so yeah, it's a, it's a bit time consuming as well, just like I think Aisha, Aisha said, but let's hear from uh, Nidima. Yeah. Uh, I, I'm conscious that we ran out of time, but uh, I'll leave uh, Nidima to answer these questions and then we'll uh, slowly wrap up. Yeah, sorry. Many of my friends call me Nidhi, which sounds very close to Nibi, so that's why I keep <laughs> sorry about that. Um, Look, I, I, I won't have too much to say on this. So for us, for B2B, obviously, social media is not so much, a, mm-hmm. you know, a place where we make a lot of efforts. Having said that, we are going to start looking for a part time social media intern because we do want to be more active uh, on like LinkedIn and Instagram, etc. at some point. And we have a lot of content and insights already shared. So I'd like to start getting I would like to get started on that. Having said that, I really resonate with what everybody said here. My influences are better. I've obviously had a seven years of B2C website for beauty. We also work with some influencers that are big, gave us a big spike in traffic, and then it, you know, kind of dies down. Um, we were also in Vogue and stuff. So initially, again, it was great, but then they churn out so much content that it, it really depends. Like, you know, if you go with smaller uh, content publications we actually got more referrals through that than actually some bigger ones like in the long run you can still see them coming through but also what has not been mentioned which I would recommend is also partnerships so for instance we won a tv ad uh, when I was uh, focusing only on my beauty matches and then we gave some free ad space to Veda to Boots not Boots sorry Benefit Cosmetics etc and we got a lot of stuff in return so and it's not just TV ad. We even did like content swap on emails, et cetera, et cetera. 
um, I'm quite creative, so I come up with concepts or whatever. And partnerships actually have been very, very good as well to get new customers, especially from uh, companies which are very complementary. Like, you know, for instance, for Lauren's company, she could do a partnership, maybe you already are doing it, I don't know. Or, you know, sustainable brands or vegan brands can also do it with vegan food companies, et cetera, and like swap customers and raise awareness that way. And I think that's actually a cheaper process because you don't even spend money. It's just a partnership. So that works. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nidima. That's a really good uh, point. Uh, I would have a million more questions, but we ran out of time. Uh, it's 10 past 7.30, uh, so it's time for us to wrap up. I want to thank you all for joining us today, sharing your knowledge and experiences and your stories. I think you're all so inspirational and amazing. And please uh, do let us know about your upcoming launches or new products or whatever. We would love to uh, be involved and help you spread out the word about it. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. I will leave now uh, Maria um, to say, uh, by as well. I also want to say thank you to everyone who tuned in, uh, to all of all of those who didn't uh, make it tonight. We will send the recording uh, tomorrow. Maria, so, over to you. Thank you so much, ladies. I love the discussion. I listened to all your answers and it was a very honest discussion. And I think there's a lot more work to do uh, in this industry, uh, but you know, you are paving the way. I, I love these brands, right? You know, and and I think that, you know, women like yourselves are role models for the next generation of, of entrepreneurs in the beauty tech space. So thank you so much for joining us. Uh, we will really cheer for you and, and support you along the way as much as we can. And to everyone who has attended, thank you so much for, for being with us today. Session is recorded. Well, everything will be distributed tomorrow. I wish everyone a good day, good night, depending on where you are. And I hope you join us for another WOW meetup soon. We have our members meet up on 2nd of June, I think. And then we have a conference on 17th of June. So I hope some of you uh, can, can join us then. Bye. And thank you so much once again for, for being with us tonight. Thank you. And bye, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, ladies.